Hello everyone, I'm Amalia Maloney with Move to Traveling, and thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to be talking about the Spanish Civil War with international journalist Lucas Larson out of Madrid, Spain. We're going to discuss how the war is still affecting Spain today and why visitors and expats in Spain should learn about the Spanish Civil War. What I would love to know first is what did you know about the Spanish Civil War before visiting or moving to Spain? Okay, so I've, I've been visiting this Spain since I was a baby. My mother's from here. Um, so I guess my first like actual knowledge might have been on one of those childhood visits. Um, one of my aunts has a, a weekend place on the western outskirts of Madrid, uh, the foot of the Sierra. And there's a old bunker uh, right around the corner from that little house um, from the Civil War. And so my cousins and I, you know, scrambling around in the countryside there would sometimes end up playing there. And at some point, you know, I kind of must have asked or someone must have mentioned what that place was. Um, so that was probably my first, that's the first memory I have. I um, might have been like eight years old uh, of, of sort of the physical leftovers of the Spanish Civil War right here in the landscape. Living in Spain now, what have you encountered and learned about the Spanish Civil War? Well, you can't really escape it. Um, even before I moved here, I would visit a lot uh, from uh, right before I moved here. I was living in the UK, and I remember going on a hike here with my dad uh, along the ridge of the Sierra de Guadarrama, along the uh, part between the Puerto de los Leones and the Abantos Peak above El Escorial. And along that ridge, you know, we went there to go hiking and, and just to see, the, you know, the countryside. But all along that ridge, there are remnants of trenches and fortifications from the war. And so, you know, the closer you get to Spain, the more you're going to encounter these things. I mean, that was me just visiting just to go for a hike and I couldn't escape it. You know, you see this 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 remnant and you can imagine yourself in this trench looking back at the city and you can see the city from out there. And you can imagine what it must have been like for these kids, you know, who, who were... Uh, charged with either defending or attacking the city. You know, you're up there and, and you can imagine civilians down in the city and you're up there in the winter uh, on the front line. Um, so, I mean, the closer I got, the closer I got to see these things. Uh, once I moved here, I moved into Spain in 2010. So I think I, it, it's not something that comes up every day, of course, um, but probably the first deeper encounter I had with it was in 2011. Uh, when a f I was working with some friends on an archaeological dig in Burgos, and they took uh, the whole crew to a, a nearby site. So our, our dig was Roman. It had nothing to do with the war. But not far away, a crew from the uh, Asociación de Recuperación de Memoria Histórica, um, they were doing an, uh, one of these exhumations of uh, mass graves from the Civil War. So that was my first really, you know, close-up encounter where you're seeing bones of people who were shot in the war. You're seeing a bullet hole through a skull. You know, you're seeing uh, rubber soles of shoes still stuck to the foot bones. Uh, you're seeing a little crucifix in the dirt. So that was probably the closest once I was living here. What kind of effects do you still see today on the local Spaniards and the culture from the Spanish Civil War? Mm. So I think there are a handful of layers. Uh, the simplest one is that every Spanish family has some story related to the war. Uh, a lot of them don't get passed down. Not everybody in those early generations wanted to talk about it, including my own grandfather. Uh, I heard almost nothing from him about the war and my mother's generation, uh, my aunts and uncles, they heard a little more, but always sort of indirectly or, or you know, the, the funny sides, uh, you know, if you could talk about the funny sides of being in the army or, or, you know, being at war, they're always silly jokes. And that's what maybe he was willing to pass down. He didn't want to talk about the darker stuff. And I think that that is this, you know, there, there are some elements of that in every Spanish family where you people in our generations, you know, the, the grandchildren and, the, and now the great grandchildren, they they know there was something going on, but it's usually diffused. It's usually diluted. It's it's, you know, people kind of know that they're not getting the whole story. Um, and I think that, you know, 
that goes for pretty much every family. I mean, I've got a friend who her grandfather is in one of those mass graves, you know? So if you dig a little bit, everyone says, oh, well, you know, I have a great grand uncle who this, or, oh yeah, well, my family, that, you know? Another one of my buddies, you know, his family, his branch of his family ended up uh, going in exile to Mexico. Um, and they, he ended up moving to Spain under the historical memory law of 2007. So he, he was able to come back because that law made it possible for descendants, uh, who were exiled after the war. So every family you talk to has some kind of connection one way or another. That in and of itself is also some answer as to, like, like you were saying, the, um, the more recent and younger generations, sometimes their, their families just haven't talked about it. And it's, uh, there's a, a distance to it for them. And I think some of the people that I interviewed for this BBC Radio 4 documentary made it very clear that that first generation, the ones who actually lived through the war in the immediate post-war years, came away with a lot of fear. And and the, 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 that fear makes it really hard to carry on a normal conversation about it. And I think the next generation inherited a lot of that, but maybe was a little bit more um, independent, a little more disconnected from the actual war, though they lived with the dictatorship. And then, at least according to Almudena Cross, one of the people I interviewed for that for that show, she she is a, a professor here in Madrid, and she is volunteers as the leader of or the president, I guess, of the Association of Friends of the International Brigades. And she says, really, it kind of fell on that third and then maybe even that fourth generation, because they were distant enough from the fear that they were able to start asking questions and do things like Emilio Silva did, where you say, OK, I want to get I want to recover the remains of my grandfather. You know, I want to mm -hmm. do whatever it is that I need to do to um, answer these questions and find some sort of closure for my family. So there are people who are doing that work and that's what we were kind of exploring in this documentary was you know why are they doing it what's motivating them how do they feel when they succeed um you know in the case of the deyera family and then in the case of the gallardo family you know they haven't yet and and who knows if they'll ever be able to recover um the remains of, of their ancestor you know um their mm -hmm. relative so i think that that it's totally an incomplete legacy. Um, and the idea of being, you know, oh, I was brought up under the democracy. Well, of course, but the democracy, it's not like a one day you switch and you can suddenly say, oh, the country went from being dictatorship to democracy. It's a process. And building a democracy is a process everywhere. Do you have plans to do more in the series of this broadcast? I'm glad you asked. We should take that up to the commissioning editors at BBC Radio 4. Um, yeah. right, right now, those were the two that were commissioned um, that, okay. that, that, that I had on deck. Um, I'm certainly going to talk to the producer. We've got you know, the idea that we'd like to do more. Uh, there's, there's always lots to talk about in Spain. Um, the key is finding the angle that interests people in, in the UK audience for BBC Radio 4 in particular, right? Uh, the same as you, you know, you're looking at a, an international audience of visitors to Spain, um, you know, you have to always think about who's your audience. So there are lots of British Spanish connections, you know, there are plenty of British folks, including um, there's, a, there's a woman who gave birth in Spain, and she claims that her baby was stolen. Um, and so she's actually behind agitation in Britain to then get the European Parliament to send a group to Spain. And I think that might have been in 2014 or 15, I'd have to check. Um, and that group came and sort of asked Spanish authorities, okay, well, what's going on? What happened here? What can we do? What archives do we need to open? You know, And that was part of what provoked the report that I cited in that, in that radio report by the National Institute of Toxicology and Forensic Sciences. So that report was kind of Spain's national government response to this parliamentary exam. So anytime we can find an international angle like that, you know, here's somebody who's got a connection, that's when we can do tell these stories to a, an English speaking audience. And so I'll be looking around for more like that for sure. Um, and of course, that's not the only outlet that, you know, we can do this for. Um, I, I'd written about the mass graves uh, three years ago for Sapiens, which is an anthropology magazine. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, plenty of other outlets are interested in these in these stories here in Spain. You definitely have quite the eager audience that is out there who are really interested, one, just to realize that there's so much to this part of, of history, this point in history that a lot of internationals outside of the, Spain don't know about. The, the desire is there to learn more about it. The, the people are there who are curious. Great. Well, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to keep digging. 
Yes. You have obviously personal ties here to Spain. You're part Spaniard. You know, moving here or spending time in another country and then also here in Spain, why do you think it's important for visitors and expats to know about the Spanish Civil War? And do you think it's important for them to know about it? I think it all depends on what you're trying to do as a traveler. You know, sometimes we travel because we want to escape the burdens of daily life. And, you know, you're going on a vacation and you want to hang out on the beach or you want to look at some cool architecture or, you know, eat. And that's that's kind of like on the entertainment side of the column, you know. And then there's the learning education, getting to know the world side of the column. And that part, you know, you don't really want to miss out on understanding the history of the places you're going. So the same way that you might visit Granada and admire the Alhambra and, you know, try to learn about uh, what was the history of, you know, Moorish presence in Spain and how did that go back and forth with, you know, Christians. And of course, all of that has battles, it has fighting, it has groups of people, you know, um, in conflict, right? Well, this is really just more recent. It's no different. And so if you think about who are these elements in Spain that were fighting, you know, brother against brother, you know, it's a civil war uh, 80 years ago. Well, that's still important. The same way that you go to France, you might visit Normandy to see where, you know, an American soldier in your family landed on the beach or something, right? Well, Plenty of Americans came to Spain to fight in the Spanish Civil War in the International Brigades, you know. So you've got already a connection if you're an American or some other foreigner who had a connection to that brigade. But quite apart from that, if you're here to learn about how the world works, if you're here to learn about how Spain works, you can't ignore the fact that people's grandparents in this country were killing each other over something. What? You know, you've got to understand that sort of political history because that ripples right through every generation since. And in fact, we've only just had the first elections in 2015 and 16, where leaders of major parties were born in democracy, right? So really, if you think about it, we're just now starting to get into the part of Spanish history where people were born after the dictatorship, are now, you know, and they're now in political roles. So I think, I think if you come for the sangria and the beaches, that's great. But if you come for some understanding of how this corner of the world works, then you've got to address the Spanish Civil War. I actually forget now what the term is, but there is a term of it. When you mentioned Normandy, it made me think of it military tourism or uh, historical tourism. It, it's based on wanting to see military sites and historical sites having to do with recent wars. There are some places that are doing that. They're doing tours of some of these bunkers um, that are left here in Spain from the Spanish Civil War, and I I found that really interesting. Um, Absolutely. There are whole books devoted to that kind of tourism in the local outdoors and uh, hiking shops. You know, there are uh, hike the Spanish Civil War sites in the mountains, a little bit like the ones that I encountered by accident. And right here in the Casa de Campo, which is a park in, in western Madrid, you can still also see sites like that. And I'm pretty sure there are organized hikes that go through there that guides do. I know that in Catalonia, at least one guide I once met, I think Nick Dusserm, organized organizes historical walking tours, including Civil War. I mean, he does, I think, on plenty of things. And that's something that this woman I mentioned earlier, Alma Cross, she organizes Civil War-related tours for foreigners all over the Madrid area. And, and I mean, not just right around the city, but in the region, you know, within striking range. And she, you know, and, and all of these guides, they know there's an interest in that. I mean, you know, it's, it's a huge industry in the U.S. for maybe older sites, you know, think Gettysburg and all that. Um, here, it's it's definitely has some interest. Um, I think probably there's almost as much interest from outsiders as from Spaniards because remember those of us who live here, we live alongside it every day. And so it's almost like, well, you walk past that wall or you walk past that, you know, bunker in the park and maybe you don't think twice about it. Um, but if you're trying to be deliberate and trying to learn something about that era of Spanish history, yeah, sure. Walking it and seeing the infrastructure is a, is a great way to do it. Um, yeah. What are your expectations and thoughts on where the country is going politically by addressing these things? Do you think it's it's good for the country that these things are being talked about? Or do you think it's detrimental to the political progress of this country? So that's a, a very live question here in Spain. Um, a lot of times people say, uh, oh, I don't want to dig up these remains or oh and, and i've heard that from people even whose own family members are in these mass graves you know they say you know what i'd rather just not think about it anymore right um and i think that's 
legitimate for them personally to make that choice to, to move on and that's fine you know um, but I think as a, as a country I think it's pretty important actually to address times when institutions and you know huge swaths of the population um, turned violent against one another you know I mean it, it, it's something that if and I think one of the folks in the in the first of the two documentaries mentioned this, you know, Eugenio Jordan, like if we don't address this and figure out what happened there and, and how to sort of prevent it in the future, you never know when that's going to happen again. And, and, I, and I don't mean that in an immediate sense. I mean, I'm not worried about Spain, you know, breaking out into war anytime soon. But what I mean is that in general, in societies, we need to understand what are the mistakes, what are the sort of natural human inclinations that lead us toward these completely um, unnecessary violent outbreaks, you know, there's, there's no reason why half of a country needs to be killing the other half. And we're still seeing it in modern countries today. I mean, look at Syria, you know, um, look at Yemen, you know, th these are countries that institutions, you know, state level uh, end up committing acts of violence against civilian populations. And if we don't address that here in Spain, how are we going to deal with that or prevent it or build up structures, international structures to, you know, handle that or, or head it off in, in other places or, or here in the future, you know? So I think it's very important. Um, and, you know, of course, you could argue that every little ceremony where they re return remains to a family doesn't necessarily build up new international case law. I mean, I, of course not. But what it does do is it helps to build a culture of reparation of, of here, look, these bones belong to you and your family. You know, it helps build up a culture of transparency. Uh, you know, this is what we think happened. You know, here are the remains. Here's the genetic testimony, you know, from these bones. It says this is this person's uh, relative, you know. That is, is important because those practices or those sort of cultural elements of, you know, transparency and examining what happened are, are part of and necessary for societies to build healthy mechanisms to avoid these problems um, down the line. Are there any other thoughts you would like to share? I think from a visitor's standpoint, you know, you know, you don't, you don't want to overwhelm a trip necessarily uh, with, you know, this sort of dark stuff because it is dark. It's worth understanding, you know, people might ask when they, when they wander through a city, why are there this region's flags on the buildings? And then why are there the Spanish flags on balconies and that part of the town, you know? Why is there regional separatism in this country? Well, that's related to these older questions of different political currents that emerged and broke uh, in, in the Spanish Civil War. And all of that then gets filtered through the next 40 years of dictatorship. And so I think if you're going to visit it helps to bite off a little chunk of this somewhere along the way, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I don't think it, it, everybody needs to go and actually, like, ex, you know, participate in a dig or whatever. I mean, there are plenty of capable volunteers and professionals here in Spain doing that work. The stories are integral, and you can't understand Spain without understanding that war. A special thank you to Lucas Larson for joining us. You can find in the YouTube description below the link to his BBC radio series, Spain's Lost Generations, which we highly recommend listening to as well. Please also join our discussion in the comments below. We'd love to hear your questions and what you think. To get the full story, visit Move to Traveling to read the post, The Ongoing Story About Spain That You Should Know which features quotes from our discussion today and insight on this topic from an American expat in Spain, a local Spaniard, and local Catalan. This is Amalia Maloney with Move to Traveling. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.